Today we are going to be talking about gardening with children and grandchildren. Many of you that are on this call or that are later watching this recording, I'm sure you have some memories of when your love for gardening began. When you engage children in gardening, you involve them in meaningful memories, you teach them the opportunities that they have to have control and grow their own food and care for the environment. Of course, when we get kids outside, it gives them the opportunity to unplug from technology. Before you dig, some recommendations that we have as master gardeners is that choose seeds that germinate quickly. For example, I always start with radishes. Radishes germinate and go to vegetable in about 14 to 20 days. So when you're choosing your seeds, you want the, the students and the kids to feel like they have control over their environment and have success. You also need to decide when you know what seeds and what you're gonna grow, what the soil quality needs to be. So soil tests are recommended through our Cobb Extension Office. Based on where you're calling in from, um, you will have a local extension office here, we have it in Cobb. Soil test is very important because different plants require different nutrients to successfully grow. Make sure that your tools and your equipment that you use for your students are kid sized. Dependent upon the, ten, uh, the temperament, the mindset of your kid that you're gardening with, and or if you have many students, an example that I love that I learned from the uh, Captain Planet Learning Gardens is they would get a bucket from Home Depot. I don't have one with me now, it's at the schools. Um, and they would put a lid on it and they put a seat cushion on the lid. So when the students are going outside, they have their spot. In their bucket is their kid-sized tools. You also wanna be aware of poisonous and thor thorny plants. When you're working with poisonous and thorny plants, keep in mind that there are some age-specific discussions to have. Here's some links available to you, and we will share links at the end of the chat. But um, my age-specific example is that if you're working with middle schoolers and you tell them not to touch something and not to go, they're going to do the opposite. So it needs to be a different discussion with that age where little kids, you can use the cute words like ouchy plants. That's an ouchy plant. That's a rose. That is a weed that has thorns, etc. Now, to give you some images of some seeds that germinate quickly, again, I've already mentioned radishes. Peas are something that is very um, good to germinate quickly, and you don't even need soil for that to germinate. We did a competition between first and fourth grade using two different species of beans, just in paper towels and in um, Ziploc bags. I talked earlier about seeds germinating quickly so the students feel a success with growing in the garden. You also want them to have ownership. They have their own tools. They have responsibilities that they should do at the garden. One of the examples that we do with our schools is students and classes have to earn the right to be the, the, the class that does water Wednesdays. Because a plant should not be just sprayed on the leaves, they actually need to water down at the soil. What we do is that class that was elected for water Wednesdays brings out their rulers and they measure, push away the soil and make make sure that the moisture went down a full inch. A plant needs one inch of water a week. It's very important, kids will eat just about anything that they grow. It's a really good opportunity to expand their palate and help improve their nutrition by growing food. Again, I talked about students with different temperaments. A lot of times when I work with adaptive and special needs students, and even concrete babies, there's fear of bugs and flying crawly things. Your 
enthusiasm that you use in the garden when you are out there, your excitement about a pollinator, your excitement about a beneficial bug like a ladybug and how it eats those aphids and the food cycle, your excitement about bees being pollinators and explaining that they're going to the flowers, not to you, will really help students and kids appreciate all of the flora and fauna that are out in the garden. Now we're gonna scroll through some of these slides relatively quickly, but here's a lot of ideas for you in your own gardens. You can make a rainbow garden. You could write your child's name. Now, if you have somebody that can help with this highly engineered H example that's on the side, or you could do something like Alex did with just the seeds writing the letters. You can make stepping stones. You wanna give them ownership to their garden space. If you have students that aren't necessarily um, fond of getting dirty, think of some crafts and some ideas that you can do that speak to that child. And the example of this slide, we have some um, Scrabble pieces made into plant markers. Your more artistic students could paint rocks to do plant markers and or your littles could eat a popsicle, wash the popsicle stick and write with their marker. Even if it's phonetically spelled and not properly spelled, it's their ownership to make their own plant markers. You could enter a contest. If you don't have a local active 4-H in your community, you certainly can find and make a contest in your own neighborhood, in your own school, in your own classroom. An example of a contest that I'm referring to, and I talked about this a little earlier, is I have red bean seeds and we have regular bean seeds. In a competition in October with Georgia Organics, it was Make Room for Legumes. It's a nutrition awareness that we do every October within our schools. First grade had the red, fourth grade had the green beans. Same plant family, both legumes, you can talk about the Latin word, which grew faster. And of course, the modified, I wonder if you could guess which grew faster. It was the green. Again, with that artist, artistic student, you could have them make garden art. This is a fun thing to do. And it's interesting, when you get students outside actually working with their hands, and especially in an adaptive or um, in my case, I've had some students that have had some behavioral situations and it really helps them catch their breath and focus on what they're doing and get control over the environment. And making fairy gardens is a really fun thing to do. Some examples of what can be existing in a fairy garden, if we can move to the next slide. These terrariums have rocks, it has clay, it has sand, I think there's some recycled material, repurposed material there. There is some little fence pieces. You could use broken clay pots. You, you could use um, little toys from the dollar store. Or it was asked of me before, well, where do you get your fairy garden materials? I buy them everywhere. We don't have sponsored big box stores for me to reference here, but there are some craft stores. I recommend maybe going to the dollhouse section and you can find things there. There's a store that I really do enjoy that has about a bunch of home goods for seasons and I can get things there. And I wish my wife, I was strong enough, I would take you outside and show you my four fairy gardens. I have sisters having tea. I have a sister that has a little cooler. I have a fairy with her foot in water and it's, the water is just a little blue rock. Um, and her other sister has, is a fairy with her hand on her fist holding a platter. She's waiting for her sister to come in for dinner with a little table that I made out of two spools from thread. Next slide. This is another example of students having fun without spending very much money in a fairy garden. They use natural materials that they found outside. If you look close, you can see some sticks and rocks made their fairy garden. If you only have a windowsill and you need to do indoor growing projects, a terrarium layer is a really good idea. You can repurpose, reuse a jar. 
It's important to have gravel on the bottom. Plants like lavender and or rosemary are Mediterranean plants that need well-drained soil. So this is a way that you can have that discussion. And I think in this picture, there's some succulents. So you don't water too much. Make grass heads. Give students ownership. This is something I do a lot more in the winter months. We take our herbs that we grew in the fall and the spring, we dehydrate them, let them dry, and then we make the teas and let them taste the teas, talk about the um, benefits of mint and what that is. And they can have, they can have a produce and they're learning to be able to conserve and homestead their food. They can make gifts. Again, we talked about give your students, your kids, I say students all the time because I'm always in schools. They all, we're all students, we're always learning. But your children, your grandchildren, if you're a teacher watching this, if you're a master gardener watching this, if a student and child has an area that they know it's their own and they have ownership, you're teaching them much more than just how to grow a plant. I, when I talk to our Board of Education, and a lot of our school administrators, I talk about the numeracy, literacy, and social emotional benefits of gardening. That literacy tie, this is a wonderful idea. Um, we did this at one of our schools. We took sunflowers, and you have to have the right soil, so remember your soil test. And we made a sunflower room. It was a place in the shade then students could go and take a book and they could read. There are many, when COVID is over, there are many wonderful gardens in the greater Atlanta area and look around, just search garden tours. Um, some of them have educational classes as well. So here's an example of two. There are resources, and we are in just a moment going to put resources on the chat. So our Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County, Earth Easy, have a lot of great resources. Next slide. Of course, I mentioned 4-H, our UGA extension, Junior Master Gardeners. There's a lot of scholastic books, and that reference is going to be on the uh, chat slide in a few moments. But I want to talk about, it doesn't have just to be a book about gardening. It can be a book about a certain kind of food. One project I did with a, kid, a group of fourth graders read to make that literary connection to first grade. The book was called Creepy Carrot and all of its struggles as it made it through the soil. The students also used their eye-hand coordination, ripped out a piece of construction paper, they made the shape of a carrot. They drew their carrot features. They put googly eyes on. They put a green hand as the leaves and it was their hand for the project. And then they had a bookmark from their reading with their reading buddies. Another example, as we scroll through this, that I love to do, compost is one of my favorite subjects, is there's a book called Compost Stew, and it talks about what can and cannot go into compost. You can make that connection, and then if it's not a natural food, it might not also be good for you if it can't go into the compost. All right, here's more of our resources. Now, if you do have any follow-up questions, do feel free to go to our extension publications. There's a lot of beautiful literature here. You can call our Cobb County Master Gardener office or call your local extension. Now we're gonna open it up. Oh, here's more links that we'll put up. Oh, and uh, forgive me, this, um, if we can go back one slide. If you are watching this from home, I do recommend that you screenshot these resources so you can go back to them because if you're not actively on the call, you wouldn't have the opportunity to copy the chat and go forward. Thank you for watching. Happy growing.